Well, my guest today is Laura Harris-Smith. She is an author, a producer, a certified nutritional counselor, an ordained minister, and just an amazing person. And I can't wait for you to hear her story today. It's something that I believe the entire body of Christ needs to hear. And Laura, first of all, thank you for being with me. Thank you for having me. Don't forget mother and grandmother. Mother and grandmother, probably the most important. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Times. And how many <laughs> kids do you have? We have six children and 10 grandchildren. That's amazing. I was just saying to you before the program, you and your husband, you look like you're in your 40s still. Aww. They don't make grandparents the way they used to. That's not how I remember my grandparents no. being. But um, tell us just a little bit about your ministry, how you got into what you're doing today. <laughs> well, uh, I have always had one foot in media and one foot in ministry. When I was three years old, my parents put me in a television commercial for a restaurant that they owned. So I don't remember it. That was their decision. Um, but so this is really, I've been in television for more than 50 years. Wow. Well, I got saved when I was 10 watching Christian television. Uh, and I, ever since that time, something in me, I just wanted to tell people about Jesus. So you got saved watching Christian TV? I did. That's amazing. I did. And my husband got saved listening to Christian radio. Huh. So even in looking at that, we see that the Lord had us, we've always had this pull and gravitation towards being used in Christian media. And it just, it just... Started, everything started to make sense. But because I had such a heart to see the lost saved, um, I, I was leading little Bible studies, you know, kids whose parents wouldn't take them to church and that kind of a thing. And I was a farmer's daughter, so I was always eating my vegetables and that type thing. But I just, I don't know, I got married at 18. I had my first baby at 19. The babies were coming every three years. And so I just began to lead this fifth gear life um, and over the decades of, you know, writing books, raising the children, we started a church 15 years ago. When you write books, you're going to be traveling and speaking, and all of that put together, uh, I wound up just really running myself down into the ground. Wow. And it was basically through sleep deprivation. I can sleep, but I wasn't. So, and I kind of wore it like a badge. Albert Einstein, he got four hours of sleep. And I was like, well, my mom gets four hours of sleep. My dad does it. Albert does it. I'll be fine. And what I learned is that if you don't, if you don't go to sleep, your organs will go to sleep for you. So I started noticing my blood work started coming back wonky. I was noticing symptoms in my body that I'd never had. Um, my organ systems seemed to be shutting down one at a time. Couldn't figure out what was going on. And then I was writing a book uh, about dreams, and biblical dreams, but also prophetic dreams. And it was called Seeing the Voice of God. And in it, I had decided to interview sleep study doctors so that I could give that physical spin on dreams. Scientists can't figure out why we sleep, much less why we dream. So I wanted to provide that aspect. And in doing that, I had to interview a sleep study doctor. And he just was saying things that were like, I was checking them off in my mind. This is happening to my body. That's happening. He said, if you don't sleep, this is what's going to happen to your body one organ at a time. And it's where I was. And had I not been in the middle of writing that, I doubt I would have gone to the doctor well, and got it. So it's interesting the Lord used work to make me study sleep yeah. because it was work that was keeping me from sleeping. So I love what I do. And uh, I, I just had to make drastic changes, set up boundaries, and... I eventually wound up having to go on bed rest for three months. They told me that I was in stage three of adrenal fatigue and that if you, uh, what, stage four is when your organs actually are shut down and you die. So I didn't even know until I was in stage three. It's also called Addison's disease, which is what John F. Kennedy had. And they said that had he not been assassinated, he still would have been dead in a year. Your adrenals are what give you energy. They are what provide you with the ability to put two people on your back and run out of a burning building. So if we are constantly living life that way, which I was, you're gonna run out of that adrenaline. And I did. And uh, so I just had to make drastic changes. I was told if I did survive, it would be 18 to 24 months before it turned around. And the Holy Spirit just, I knew really quickly that although I'd had many miracles before, seen inst uh, him do instant miracles in my body, he wasn't doing that this time. And ministry was born out of this, you see, because he required me to cooperate with him. Uh, every food became, every meal became like a final exam, as I was telling you before, because it, I had to just learn to use food as medicine mm. to get my body where it needed to be. It couldn't handle a bunch of medications even. 
And so that's really in that place of bed rest, and as I was finishing that book on dreams, where the idea came for my next project, which was helping people get healthy body, mind, and spirit, eating the right foods, eating the right things spiritually, and even psychologically, media and, and things like this. I just, I just wanted to create a total temple cleansing for people like God did for me. And, you know, interestingly enough, you know, people often think six months is too hard to, to bite off. Uh, when you're told 18 to 20 more, six, six months seems great. But I actually got it down to 30 days and things that I feel like that you can do to set new patterns and really just create like a reset button for your body, mind, and spirit. So I yeah. did get totally healthy um, again, like I said, in six months God did it. And I just wanted to tell the world that if you'll take care of yourself, body, mind, and spirit, you'll get more done, done for the Lord. You really will. Yeah, and it, this is very important, especially in, in this time, this day and age, it, because it seems like we, we live a very fast-paced lifestyle, probably way more than our ancestors oh, did yeah. or we were ever intended to. Oh, yeah. Even at night, I mean, it used to be the sun goes down, it's dark, and you can't you do anything. Now, now mm -hmm. we can power ourselves through the night, mm -hmm. watch television, be on the phones. Yeah. You know, I, I'll wake up in the middle of the night, check my phone. Yeah. It's the kind of world we live in. Do you find that this is it becoming is. more and more of a, a problem? Oh, yeah. And the interesting thing is that the, the sleep, I'm convinced that sleep doctors could put all the other doctors out of business. Mm. If we can get our sleep regulated, which now, like, I'll get eight, nine hours sleep a night. Even if I go to bed at midnight, I have a rule. I'll try to lay there till 8 a.m. even if I wake up early. If I go to bed at 1, because I'm a night owl. I don't think I'll ever rid myself of that. <laughs> I'll try to sleep until 9. And it's really shown up in my health. I feel like I'm in my 20s. I feel like I did when I was in high school. And I'm just convinced that because of that very thing you named, when we wake up in the night, or even if we're trying to go to sleep and we're reading something on our tablet or checking our phone in the middle of the night, that ambient light, although it's low, it hits our optic nerve, which then signals to the pineal gland to shut off the production of melatonin, which is the sleepy hormone. So we're never going to be going through the proper dream, well, actually even sleep cycles, yeah. that then lead up to dream sleep, which I think is a sacred time when the Holy Spirit can communicate with us. So, yeah, I pretty much think that if we could get our sleep figured out, a lot of our physical symptoms would go away. Um, you never go into a doctor and and you're saying, I have this symptom in my heart or in my lungs or in my kidney, none of them are ever going to say, well, if you'd sleep more, they just say, here's a prescription yeah, for this. Yeah, take some more drugs. And so I, I honestly think if we could just, first of all, be Sabbath keepers, you know, but then also learn to live in a, in a constant state of rest and then give our bodies actual rest at night, it would take care of many of the diseases that we have and certainly a lot of the stress. Yeah. Now, you're a minister, you and your husband, pastor, you travel around and speak, yes. but you also have this health component. You, By the way, you became a nutritionist mm -hmm. as a result of these things that you had, and you've written books about it, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But um, some people might be watching this and saying, well, how does an evangelistic ministry that you know believes in miracles and all this, yeah. how does that combine with healing and you know these holistic yeah. nutritional sleep all that stuff how do those two things come I together i'm so glad that you asked that because i speak both camps fluently i feel like you've got the the health and nutrition camp who <clears throat> they understand food and responsibility living long you're the temple of the holy spirit right mm -hmm. but they maybe don't have a lot of faith for miracles and healing and then you've got the what i call the one and done camp, of which I'm probably one. We pastor a charismatic church, you know, and so I believe in miracles. I've experienced them. I've seen them flow through us. So there's that camp who has great faith, but then they eat garbage and just expect the Holy Spirit's got their back. And yeah. I have lost so many good minister friends, and you, nobody wants to say this at the funeral, but to things that I know they did to themselves. And yes, the Holy Spirit can he can heal anything, but I sure would love to give him less crisis intervention prayers yeah. and more just moving, you know, with the wind of God at our backs yeah. because we're not constantly sick. So I speak both camps fluently. I grew up in a very conservative denomination where I did not believe in miracles. So I understand this camp over here that has to, many of them move in it like works. Yeah, sure. Okay. 
And I understand this camp, which believes in miracles. And I want to bring the two of them together because I personally believe that good nutrition is not works. I think it takes a whole lot more work to get sick because God created us to be whole. Yeah. Well, and, and you mentioned the people that, you know, you know, you say, well, they did it to themselves. I, I don't think these are bad people. I think often what I find is that people that are in, have these lifestyles that are killing them, they just don't know what is the right thing to do. It's like if they knew what to do and they were confident that it would work, they would do it. The problem is they've been sold all these different diet programs that they've tried, they've gone around, they, they lost 10 pounds, and they gained 30 pounds back. And they, they've come to a place, a lot of people, where they're just saying, I give up, nothing works, this is just my lot in life. Mm -hmm. Well, can I just tell you this? You see, uh, how did sin enter the world? Through food. Through food. <laughs> and so what did, how did Esau sell his birthright? With food. Um, what did the Israelites complain about in the desert? Food. We see Jesus passed the food test in the desert. You know, he said, he could have just turned all the rocks into bread, but he said, no, man doesn't live by bread alone. So I also offer as proof that our food and our faith are linked, that when you remove food for a period of time, fasting, incredible things happen to your faith. So I think they work in tandem with each other. Sure. Food is something that God can use early on. I'll tell you, with all six of our children, it's not a real popular topic these days, but food was the first tool we used with them, just scheduling them, not to serve the schedule, but so that the schedule could serve you to where they didn't grow up becoming people who ate every two hours and developed this part of their flesh that just demanded to be fed all of the time. And so... It's interesting how food, again and again and again, is something God will use in your life to cut to your deepest desires, things that replace him even. Now, I love to eat. I hate to cook. So I had to find the things that were most healthy. Um, I don't believe in living on diets. I basically eat like a, like a caveman, what can be hunted and gathered, <laughs> you know. And I, like I said, once you start to feel the effects of that, and you realize how much more you can accomplish for the Lord. I want to live long, and I want to live strong, and I don't want to put ammunition in the enemy's gun. Yeah. So for somebody that's been on that uh, carousel of, you know, binge dieting, and, and just nothing's worked for them, what, what's the key? What, what are they missing in that equation? Well, there are things that you, first of all, you need a revelation from the Holy Spirit that, I, that you have personal responsibility you do in your, in your sin life, you know, in your spiritual life and in your emotional life. Um, we had a man who came to the altar one time and he was asking for a miracle for his digestive system. He was in bad shape. And I, I believe we're gonna call down a miracle. When I, somebody asked me to pray for them, I'm like, let's do it. You're here asking, you got the gift of faith matching the gift of healings and miracles. We're gonna get something done right here, right now. But then I asked him afterwards, I said, tell me what you eat. And he looked at me and he said, garbage, you know, and it, I'm from Nashville, so in the southern accent, he's a garbage, and I thought, so isn't that like if an adulterer comes to the altar, and they pray, and they repent, and they say, I you know, did this, and they their spouse, and they're sorry, and then they say, but it's a lifestyle for me. I'm going to continue to do it. We frown on that, but we're okay with God healing us and then putting garbage in our body, so I would say the first thing is remove some things, ask the Holy Spirit to show you what that is, or pick up some literature that can really help you get back on the right track and then replacing it with the right things. You do it for your car. Yeah. You do it for anything that you fuel. Uh, do it for your body. Yeah, and you. this is something you've lived, like you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And out of that experience where you were basically on death's doorstep and you came out of that through health, through nutrition, mm -hmm. Um, you, you put together a book, and we're, I'm going to show people how to get that in a minute, but just tell people what, what it's about and, and how it works. <laughs> well, it's a book on faith uh, because, you know, when you, when you say faith toxins, like how do you, and this is in the title of the book even, like how do you, how does your faith get toxic? The thing is that just like we can pollute our bodies, our faith can get polluted. Uh, let's say you go to pray for someone, and they want to be healed, and then they don't get healed. In fact, maybe they die. And so the next time you're asked, hey, come down to the hospital, we've got to pray for so-and-so, your faith is a little like, well, it didn't work last time. Are they going to get healed this time? 
And so in that sense, your faith almost needs a, a, a detox. Yeah. Same with your body, same with your emotions. So what I did was I try to create uh, a program where we clean all three. And so I do say it's a total temple cleansing, but also by the end of the book, you have detoxed all 15 major body systems, your cardiovascular system, your urinary system, you know, your circulatory system. It's a total body detox. Wow. And it's Five years ago, what started as a dream grew into a broadcast TV channel that carries the gospel from Europe to the nations. A channel that brings the love of Christ into each home, transforming hearts and minds and igniting revival around the world. It is by His hand that God TV is shaping culture through media and changing lives. And is by your hands that we found community and support in the journey. Join us as we look back and celebrate 25 years of God TV. Give today to God TV.